as an illustration. So um, I think big picture, we all appreciate the idea of needing to influence people, right? So, you know, um, many of you guys have been very senior in your organizations, and yes, it, it may be the case that you can go around just telling people to do something. But as you may wait, well, telling somebody to do something might result in them just sort of complying with what it is that you want them to do, which is all fine and good, but it doesn't necessarily result in them being committed to what it is that you're thinking about wanting them to do uh, and the course of action that you're pursuing. Um, and as a result of that, these ideas around influence and persuasion are really, really key because they move beyond getting somebody to just simply comply with what it is that you're requesting to actually being truly committed to the course that you're setting for them. Such that when you're not in the room, when you're away um, at LBS attending a course or at a meeting in a different organization, these individuals are still doing the things that you want them to do. And that, in some sense, is a, a big reason why we have these ideas and want to think about these ideas of influence and persuasion. Uh, as I said, there's a very, very large area of research around this, and I want to share with you just six basic principles around how it is that uh, we interact with people, right? So um, uh, this work has really been influenced by a, a guy called Robert Cialdini. Uh, he's a social psychologist. And he, he came up with these ideas, these six principles, and thinks of them as these sort of like interpersonal principles of influence. And that's kind of what I'm doing uh, this morning, sharing these ideas with you. So if we start off just kind of at the top and work our way down, um, if we think about the idea of reciprocity, reciprocity is this very, very powerful sense that when I do somebody a favor, they feel a compunction to do a favor back for me in return. I'm sure that you can think of many, many instances in your own lives when, when you're trying to get somebody to do something, rather than just making request after request after request, it may actually be easier to do them a little favor first, and then all of a sudden they're actually much more likely to do something back for you in return, right? So in negotiations, we know this very, very well, that um, if, for instance, we want the other person to share information about their priorities, actually a really, really good way of trying to start that process is to share a little bit of information with them. When we do that, that kicks out this process of reciprocity, and then hopefully, and usually, people then feel a, a sense of, uh, of, of duty to uh, respond in kind and give you some information back in return. Um, I have this thing here. Um, anybody know what I'm talking about? What, what, what this is? It's very popular in the US. So, these are like mailing labels, so return address labels. And I don't know how many of you guys have experienced this, but sometimes we'll send these out. So, just remember that that's naughty. So, tell me a little bit about this. Uh, I remember when I lived in England, uh, people get those, those names addressed in the phrase, and then after you get that, you have to be invited to make up in the future. Yeah, uh, and it's, I mean, this is exactly, they're trying to work on this principle of reciprocity, okay? Um, did you ever donate opportunity? Yeah. Okay, um, so I'm more generous than I was. Right? I was when I was in the US, I was always a Scrubby student, so I would get these in the mail, and uh, Scrubby student, uh, as my excuse, I, I, never, I never donated. But this is the principle that they're working on, right? So, they're printing out these uh, return address uh, uh, little stickers, and, and obviously, this is incredibly cheap for them to do. You can only imagine, all they need is a color printer. Or some uh, uh, stickers from, from Office Depot, and then they're printing them out on us, and then they send it to you. And now you receive this thing, and oh my goodness, it's a personalized gift. How thoughtful of them. And then they kick in this idea of reciprocity, and now you feel a slight need to do them a favor return. Uh, there are many other examples of this. Um, so, you know, this is this idea like, like, we need it in the mail. Um, I mentioned this idea of um, uh, uh, reciprocity in negotiations, like giving some information to get information. But I'll give you another example. So, this is a study that was done um, some years back, and they were trying to figure out how to get people to respond to surveys. So, I don't know if you guys have to do customer surveys or even uh, in house surveys where you're trying to get your employees to respond to you, but this is an interesting one. So, uh, this company was interested in trying to understand, uh, not the company, sorry, these bunch of researchers were interested in trying to understand how to get people to respond to surveys. So what did they do? They had um, two groups of people, and one group of people, they sent out the survey and they said, hey, we'd like you to complete the survey, it's really important for us, we're all part of this organization, we want feedback from you, uh, and if you uh, complete the survey and get back to us, we will send you a check for $25. I mean, $25 is, it's, it's, it's not a small amount of money, it's a decent amount of money, you know, I, I could get a very nice lunch or a simple dinner for that, okay, I can, I can work with that. And then in the other condition, what they did was they sent out the survey and they said, hey, we'd really, really like people to complete the survey, here's a $5 check, it's yours to keep whether you complete the survey or not, but uh, we'd really like you to complete the survey. People were much more likely to complete and return the survey in this condition. Now, cynics in the room are probably going, hang on a second, I've just sent out like a lot of $5 checks, am I in a lot of trouble now? Interestingly, no. People in this condition tended to be honest. They tended not to cash the check unless they actually completed the survey. So this idea of reciprocity was, one, more effective and more cost efficient than this idea of, hey, you do something for me, then I do something back for you in the church. Right? So this idea of reciprocity is quite powerful. Any ideas that you guys can think of around reciprocity? I just have you seen it play out in your lives or in your organizational lives? If you get promoted, sometimes in some situations it may be that uh, you have this credit of trust from your boss or shareholders or whatever, you have to justify this. Yeah, yeah. So interestingly enough, you've done the work to get the promotion, but even then they're giving you this promotion, and now there's this sense that, oh my goodness, I really, really need to do good by them for, giving, for putting their trust in me. Okay, thank you. Anything else that you guys can think of? Any other examples that you can think of? I'll give you a funny example, um, but this also gets a little bit at how, as we start thinking about how to use influence, it's also I think, interesting to think about how it is that we make sure that it's not being used against us. Okay, so this is a funny example that puts those two ideas together. Um, I'm um, Singaporean originally. Um, I know that my accent is not completely my work. I lived in the US for a long time. I lived here. Um, uh, in Singapore, uh, one of the things that we celebrate is Chinese New Year. And during Chinese New Year, um, and this is a very Singaporean uh, um, custom, it's not even necessarily a more broad and Chinese custom. But in Singapore, when you celebrate Chinese New Year, you uh, go visit all your friends and family, which is the same across China. But the unique thing in Singapore is that when you do this, you bring two mandarin oranges to your host home. Okay, and uh, it's two mandarin oranges because the word for uh, mandarin oranges uh, uh, in, in Chinese sounds like gold, sounds like fortune. So in a very Chinese way, they're playing on this like, linguistic thing to say, I'm bringing you fortune. Okay? So what happens is that uh, you go to your host home, you bring two oranges with you, you give them to them, and they now immediately feel the need to return. So what do they do? They go to their kitchen, um, put those two oranges down, take two oranges, and give them back to you. So you start with two oranges now, you know, five minutes later, you remember two oranges. So then you repeat this process as you visit the houses, right? So you visit the next house, hey, you still have two oranges. So you give it to your new host, your new host gives you new oranges back in return, you still have two oranges. So you keep doing this process of giving favors and then reciprocating, such that at the end of the day, you still have two oranges. You started with two oranges, at the end of it might not be the same two oranges, but you still have two oranges. And it really is this a very ritualized version of
Can you guys think of how else you might, you know, try and subdue this new tactic that they're being used against you? I think I went to the Scotch. You can look for your torrent if you need to as a troll. Thank you. <laughs> so, 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 okay, for those who are not in on the, on the details, tell me a little bit about how this... Okay. 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 I see. Okay. Okay. Good. 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 So you could, you could pay for it, you could decline to accept it. But my guess is that in an organization such as well, in most situations, that could come across as kind of rude, right? Uh, so yes, you can try that, okay? but uh, be careful that you don't offend your, your, your counterparts. Uh, other things that you could do. You just ask please, what do you want? Yeah. Absolutely, right. so there's just a sense of tip attack, you know, down the line, I remember it's my turn to, to, to pay for my decision. Uh, somebody had a... Yeah. I think it's a question, how do we protect ourselves? Yeah, yeah, so exactly, right? Okay. Be aware that's what we're trying to do. Yes. And seeing yourself basically... Seeing yourself basically. I don't dispute it, so in some sense, as we go through all these different types of different tactics, that is the... Um, the advice that will be consistent for many of them. But I'm going to present to you some research that basically says, you know what, sometimes that doesn't work as well as we'd like to think that it would. Um, and to, to, in that regard, then we present to have other ways of tackling them. My guess is that, for instance, within an organizational setting, many, many, many of you guys will have rules within your organization that say, I can have this gift, but not this gift, a certain value of gifts or different things that I can do. These organizational boundaries are there in some sense because sometimes just us saying, I understand what you're doing and I'm not going to fall prey to it is not necessarily sufficient. Um, so, some things that we can do, as I said, we could try and reject the gift, but it could be, it's not necessarily easier to be seen as a We could be happy this, right? Accept the gift, but kind of be wary of what's going on. And yeah, that can work. Don't get me, uh, I'm not trying to say that it won't work, but I'm just saying that it's not as easy as it might sometimes be. Um, uh, that whenever this happens to me, I, I generally like to have a ready excuse. You know, somebody, I go into a shop and try to uh, and buy something, and me, uh, a coffee or whatever it might be. Thanks, I just had breakfast. Uh, I don't need anything right now. That doesn't necessarily stop them from still trying to really, like, force this stuff on me, uh, but at least if I have a ready excuse, that potentially uh, uh, helps me to uh, overcome their, their need to accept it. That's responsibility. Let me give you some other ideas to think about. Um, another tactic that uh, Chaldini talks about is this idea of commitment and consistency. Um, the idea of commitment and consistency is that once we make a decision and we head down a particular path of action, um, we do need to be consistent with that course of action. And this will happen um, even if we get negative feedback about our actions, and it's particularly effective if uh, the commitments are done in an really active uh, public way. Right? You can imagine, like, if you stand up and you say things like, you know, uh, 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 I am going to, uh, you know, New Year's is coming, I'm going to make a resolution to start going to the gym. If you make that sort of like, public commitment, it becomes much more effective in ensuring that you become consistent with that course of action down the road. So I have another example. Um, a bumper sticker, right? So uh, not as common here again, but uh, again, this is potentially a bit of a US example. Uh, but when I was in the US, I remember seeing uh, uh, bumper stickers for every which cause that was out there. But beyond that, uh, for uh, children's schools, right? Always a proud parent of, you know, uh, whatever uh, whatever school. Why do people do that? Why, why are these things so prevalent? And then prevalent time, also very, very prevalent. Why are they out there? Okay. 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 And then what happens when that brand comes knocking on your door for the money or you know or your time commitment or something like that? You've defined this is exactly you're exactly right, right? Spot on. You've defined yourself as that is part of your brand. So when that brand comes saying, I need your help in terms of time, whether it's for the children's school or money for saving the whales or whatever it might be, you're much, much more likely to do that. Right. Um, uh, another example, this one is um I love this example because it uh, combines these different uh, a couple of these different influence tactics. And one of the things to think about if you're trying to go around influencing and persuading other people is that if you can tap into multiple of these principles, whatever you're doing becomes ever more powerful because it fundamentally means that it's leveraging off of different psychological ideas simultaneously. Okay, so example. How many of you guys have been, uh, let's say, on the plane and you're reading some sort of magazine and you see in the magazine this little tear off thing that says you can get three weeks or three issues or free of this magazine and then after that, you know, you, you have to stop it. How many of you guys have seen that? Yeah? How many of you guys have signed up for that? Okay, and, and tell me a little bit about You did remember to cancel. Well done, you. So, how, how or why did you remember to cancel it? <laughs> But this, this, to a large extent, is this idea of like, commitment and consistency. But there's also reciprocity, going back to what we just talked about, right? They're giving you three free issues or whatever it might be. And then there is also the hope that, hey, I'm reading this. I'm reading, you know, whether it's National Geographic or The Economist or whatever it might be. And especially, come on, let's say The Economist. I'm reading it now. Wow. I'm feeling so smart for reading The Economist, okay? And, and you know what? You know what? I want to be that smart person who reads The Economist. So when it comes time to renew my subscription, to actually stop paying for my subscription, I'm quite likely to do it because I coded myself as a person who reads The Economist. But honestly speaking, I don't know about you guys, but The Economist, if it comes out once, once a week, um, it takes me a month to read each issue, right? So there's just a giant backlog of economists sitting on my desk, and I'm still shelling out money because I've coded myself as someone who reads The Economist. Other examples that I have for you of what is idea of commitment and consistency. So we talked about uh, bumper stickers. Petitions are very similar in nature. Has anybody heard of the foot and door technique? I, I hear you, sir. So I'm going to work with our, with our new guest who's just joined us to come for sharing a little bit. No, 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 sorry, I'm putting you on the spot. But you're laughing, so uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about this foot and door technique? Wait, like, you're on the inside before like, people know actually what you're talking about. Uh, Kind of, yeah. Anybody else familiar with the ta tactic? Stem from brush sales. Yeah, so thank you. That, that, that's pretty much this idea that um, it, it uh, came about when people used to go door to door uh, selling stuff, whether it's brushes or whatever it might be. And the idea is simply that, hey, if I can get my foot in, I can get the rest of myself through the door. Okay? Uh, because once you've committed to letting me just you know, get in a little bit, I can open that door further. Uh, 
There was a study done in, and this is how it's done, it's a beautiful study, it's done in the 1960s, so it's done in the sort of the that's what I'm talking about, it's really, um, it's kind of amazing. So, um, this was done in California, uh, and they were interested in getting people to put a big, ugly sign saying drive casually on, uh, on these people's uh, front arts, okay? Um, and they were kind of curious about how to get people to comply with this request. And so, in one position, they knocked on a bunch of doors in the neighborhood and said, Hi, we're very interested in people driving casually in the neighborhood. Will you be willing to put this big sign, which was very, very ugly, on your front yard? People looked at the sign and they're like, mm, nothing, okay? 17% of the people here said that they were willing to put a big, ugly sign on their front yards. The other condition, they knocked on the door and said, Hi, I'm interested in people driving casually in the neighborhood. Would you be willing to put this little sticker saying drive casually on the window? Everyone said yes. Move to the neighborhood, to the children, they want to keep it back So, absolutely, everybody said yes. Two weeks later, knock, knock, knock. Would you be willing to put this big, ugly sign saying drive casually on your front lawn? 76% of the people said yes, right? But it's 17 from the other condition. So think about a time when if you're trying to get somebody to do something for you and their initial response is no, no, no. Think about whether you can make a smaller ask initially because that means the way to try and get them to do the big ask later on. This is this idea of commitment and consistency. Um, how do we prevent uh, from, well, I'll give you one idea. Um, the, there's a very, very um, powerful area of interest. Uh, they talk about something called escalation of commitment. Okay, escalation of commitment is the first phenomenon where if people make investments, uh, typically money, but also time or energy in a particular course of action, and then they get negative feedback, People typically feel, people typically reinvest in the same course of action because they feel the need to be consistent with their initial choice, right? So from an economic, economic standpoint, this is considered irrational. It's considered throwing uh, good money after that. You're supposed to ignore some costs and people are honoring some costs. And uh, this escalation phenomenon has been used to explain anything ranging from R&D investments to uh, commitment to personnel, right? So you hire somebody, they're not working out quite right. Well, we could ask them to exit or we could give them more training. Well, let's give them more training and more training and more training, even though maybe we should be thinking about making this It's been used to explain uh, the Vietnam War. It's been used to explain uh, even things like the amount of time that basketball players uh, have on court. So even now, if you try to control for how much, uh, how, how good these players were, but even then, if these, these uh, basketball players were recruited with a big lump sum of money, they ended up having more, more playing time on the court. Understanding all of this, how do we try and prevent some of these uh, things from happening? How do we ensure that the decisions that we're making are good decisions and not biased by these initial commitments that we make? And the escalation commitment is going to give us a stop loss position looking at data rather than, you know, general, Okay, so being very confident and objective in the data, I will say that research has found that the way that we look at the data becomes biased because of this, right? Um, so I hear you and I agree with that. The stop loss is this, this bottom line, this reservation process, remind the line to stop, which I also agree with. And so this is very difficult to prevent and you need to try many things. So these are good, but may not be sufficient. Other things that we can do. Very good idea, right? So um, what's happening is that if I make the initial choice to invest resources in the course of action, I'm the one who feels as though I need to be consistent. But if I have a neutral third party make the reinvestment decision, so a colleague who can help me with my thinking, help me analyze the data, that can be very helpful because this colleague is not burdened by the same need to be, commit, uh, to be consistent with initial commitments. Other things that you can think about. Um, this is one of those where um, we say ignore some cost, right? So this is very, very rational to say, well, we can try to understand these things are happening to us and we just need to say no. Uh, uh, and my dissertation from many, many, many years ago was looking at exactly this idea. When it comes to these sunk costs, can we just say, you know what, we, we just need to ignore them. We just need to understand that they're there and ignore them. The problem is that we don't go around saying, ooh, let, let me look out for sunk costs. Ooh, let me be aware of sunk costs. And the next thing you know, the sunk costs hit you and then you feel this, this, this need to be consistent. This is why these principles are as potentially tricky as they are. Um, yeah, so some ideas there. Let me give you more things to think about. So we talked about reciprocity, we talked about commitment and consistency. There's this idea of social proof, um, which is this notion that when the cause of action is things are Sorry, can I just go back onto the last one? Yeah. So, so without asking for more specific, <clears throat> I'm not sure I can deal with it. Um, I, I would say that you want to try and find a grateful exit, right? Like people, so a grateful exit, a grateful mission to, to back up from that commitment. But the other thing too is to find an alternative. So a lot of these types of um, uh, commitment and consistency things, it, 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 in your head, it becomes go, no go. It becomes invest, not invest. It becomes um, let the person in, don't let the person in. But if we can think of an alternative path, an alternative acceptable path, then all of a sudden the thinking becomes different, and it's not so binary. It's not so oh my god, I have to do this to be consistent. There's wait, hang on a second, maybe there's an alternative thing that I can do with it. So without the gory details, what can I do? Yes, in a face saving manner. Yeah, yeah. For you as well, probably. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, social proof. Uh, social proof is saying that when the course of action is not completely clear, um, we very often look to other people around us as to what it is to do, and we follow them, right? We're much more likely to follow people who are like.